Good this morning and welcome to Forest Heights Baptist Church here at 804 Tanger Drive in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I hope that you're having a great morning this morning. And if you uh, have a Bible, I invite you to turn with us to uh, the Old Testament book, 1 Samuel. We're in the 19th uh, chapter this morning and uh, we're going to read uh, starting in verse 8. I'm reading from the NIV. I believe you'll be able to follow along in whatever version you have. And uh, so this morning, reading from 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 8, once more war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such a force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand while David was playing the lyre. Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good on his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, called, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michael let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. And then Michael took an idol and laid it on his bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair on his head. And when Saul sent men to capture David, Michael said, he is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him back to me in the bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was an idol in the bed and, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michael, why do you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michael told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David began to, uh, had fled and he made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it and he sent more men. And they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time and they also prophesied. And finally, he left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Seku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the spirit of God came even on him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say is Saul also among the prophets. So I added a few more verses there that weren't in your bulletin if you were following that, but we're going to we're going to look at all those verses from 8 down through 24. And uh, and the idea here is uh, that uh, David has uh, has received success. Saul had set about to get rid of David several times. He's already been uh, upset with him at different times. David, remember, has come to Saul's house to, uh, at his beckoning to play the music to help him with his temperament uh, problems, his anxiousness, his anxieties, his, his uh, headaches, whatever it was that was bothering him. It was so stressful and so t intense that he needed something to help him, and, and uh, David's music playing would help him, even though Saul had, different, had already twice tried to kill him. And, uh, and then he had married Saul's daughter, uh, Goliath was defeated and so on. And so he, uh, at this point, at least previously to this, in the last section we read of in the top of verse 19, Saul had kind of given himself over the idea that David was a good guy and that he was okay, that uh, he was going to allow this to go, him to keep coming to his thing and he wasn't going to see him as a threat. We don't know how much time has happened since verse 7. Uh, when it basically was left kind of at that situation to now, uh, but we don't know how many how many days or weeks or months gone by before the Philistines attack again. But they have attacked again, and uh, David was the was the chief uh, uh, warrior for against the Philistines, and so Saul has obviously sent him out to fight them. And when he did, of course, he achieved the success that that he had achieved all the other times. And uh, this then creates a uh, this resurgence of Saul's uh, 
evil uh, intentions against David. It causes Saul to remember of the praise David received and all that and his jealous rage, his envy, all the other emotions that went with that were brought back. And along that same line, apparently he's in one of these uh, places where he's having this intense migraine uh, and all these things are happening. And so David is sitting there where he had always been uh, since he is invited to play the lyre to soothe Saul. In the midst of that, of course, Saul tries to attack him and so on we, as we've read. So what, uh, what's going on here? Well, the thing that I think we can pick up on this, and we started kind of talking about it last time, but one of the things that you can uh, always write down is whenever you uh, have a spiritual victory, evil is quick on the heels. The evil is going to come and challenge that victory. Uh, it, it, it seems to be that no matter what happened to David, no matter how much success he has, no matter how many times he wins, uh, that Saul and, and even Saul and his willingness to kind of compromise and make some peace and decide that, that he needs David at the urging of Jonathan, uh, that uh, this evil is going to keep on coming. And you may be able to have an example of your own where, where you have some success in your life, you've overcome some uh, personal battle with the with it, something in your own life, some sort of evil, some sort of temptation, some sort of sin that you've overcome, or maybe you've decided that you know you've been out of the uh, worship service, out of Sunday school or something, and you decide to come to Sunday school, you decide to start coming again, and you make those uh, you make those uh, moves in that direction, and you come and attend, and the next thing you know, it seems like everything is going against you. You had a flat tire, you know, uh, this came up and that came up and this happens and that happens. Or, you know, no sooner than you had gotten over this uh, very strong temptation or whatever it was, somebody comes along and offers you an opportunity to uh, take it up again. And, uh, and that's what happens. Uh, it's, it's, it's the devil is never uh, taking a vacation. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 20, that destruction and death and destruction are never satisfied. And so they're always going to be out there. Our enemy has not gone away. We have been promised the victory by Jesus through Christ. If you come to know the Lord as your Savior, you have certainly attained the victory. And uh, having attained that and having, a, having that promise to us does not mean that in our life that evil is not going on around us and that evil is not interested in still attacking us and taking us off. And this is what happened. Uh, you know, you can look at anything you want to and see where people, you know, we talked about it this morning. Over the last several years, we've noticed that a great decline in the people that attend churches. Uh, it's not just ours or any one particular uh, denomination that seems to be widespread. And the COVID comes along and boom, uh, there are even more people. Now they have all kinds of excuses and all kinds of reasons. You know, we didn't, we didn't stop coming here uh, and we were here every time and I understand that some people felt uncomfortable, that's okay, but it's over with, you know, in spite of all the yeah, yeah, and back and forth, even our president who's uh, gone out to lunch most of the time has said it's over with, it's over with. You know, we're gonna have that just like we have the flu and colds and everything else we've had for the rest of our life, it's going on, but guess what? We're back, it's, it should be that people should be going, okay, well, I'm ready to get back in fellowship and do that, but no, that's not what's happened. Why? Because the evil one has taken advantage of the situation and drawn people and given them all kinds of reasons and excuses that they don't need to be here, they don't need to attend in person, they don't have to do this, they don't have to do that, and plus, the culture has uh, basically cast the church in, in the darkest possible light and you know as it has and this is not the first time in history these things have happened and so we have to be aware we have to be aware when you achieve any kind of victory when you win anything just like people are, are very excited and should be over the our supreme court uh, opening up the 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 overthrowing the roe versus way however understand this what immediately ensued was this, it's just like you cornered a cat, you know, the claws come out, the teeth come out, and now we find out, you know, just how, how strongly these evil people are willing to do. They'll do anything. They'll kill people. They'll, they'll do all kinds of things uh, uh, to try to throw that off. And there are plenty of uh, people 
So beware of the illusion of peace when there is no peace. People say, oh, peace, peace, and there is no peace. The fact of the matter is, Jesus said to them, his disciples, he said, when I'm gone, he said, there's going to be all kinds of things happening. People are going to tell you it's okay, everything's fine, but it's not. It's not that way. Beware, be ready, be ready to act. There is uh, somebody said one time, uh, I think it was a Malaysian uh, proverb, but anyway, it says this, don't think there are no crocodiles because the water is calm. And I think that's true. Uh, but what we are to do, whenever we are to do, we are to keep on achieving these spiritual victories, but be ready that you may find that there will be all kind of evil things. Now, you may not call them evil because that's not popular. Okay, let's call them distractions then. Let's call them temptations. Let's call them things that will cause you to suddenly go back to where you were before. Anything that the evil can do. What we're to do is we're to work as unto the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. We work that way. We work as unto the Lord. We're working to the, for the Lord and we're doing his business. And we don't let these things throw us off our game. Well, what happens next in this situation is, of course, we see that because David gets this spirit thrown at him and God uh, makes it so that he is able to elude it for the third time here now. And, uh, and so now he gets, he says, okay, it's time for me to move on. It's time for me to do something different. This is getting too intense. And so he Saul's overt actions are getting louder and louder and more bold. So he, he goes home, uh, which was, you know, he would consider to be a safe place and he gets there. Then what happens? Well, uh, his wife tells him, Hey, look, you need to escape. You need to get out of town because he's going to kill you. She has her sources, it's like always. And, and so she uh, warns him and she lets him down out through a window. It might remind you of, of Moses rescued by, by a, an evil king's daughter. It might remind you of Jacob uh, as rescue. It might remind you of Rahab rescue. It might remind you of several people who have been rescued by others uh, you know, and the idea is that God has a way of solving these problems. Now, she uh, knew that they were going to come to the house to get him. Saul is so bold now that he tells other people he's going to kill David. And so he sends his troops out there. So what she do? Uh, well, uh, she uh, comes up with a plan. And this gives us some insight into her situation. Michael uh, takes one of her idols. Now, notice that. So David is a man of the Lord, man after large heart, man doing God's work. But his wife, on the other hand, was still had pagan idols in the house that she was obviously had there because she still had not come to that place. And so she takes one of these idols and uses it as a fake, right, to, to pretend that David was still in the bed. And because she was the king's daughter, when the men come, she says he's ill. They go back and say, well, we're, they're reluctant to go against the, the king's daughter because she still is who she is. And so uh, they go back and Saul said, well, okay, he's ill. Bring the bed and him and everything, uh, you know, to me. And I'll kill him right here. So this is getting, the, the evil is getting more bold. And uh, interesting thing about this is God, you know, God guides even the intention of the lost people. If you're, if you're serving the Lord and you're on the Lord's team and you're doing what the Lord wants and you're facing this, this pushback as a light way of putting, I guess, that you've done, you've achieved some of the success. You, you started attending Sunday school. You started attending other services. You started attending church. You got saved. You started, you overcome a temptation. You overcome something in your life that you've been struggling with. And, God, and the devil pushes back against it. And then these people around you, they have, uh, you know, they're not necessarily saved people, but some of them are helping you or something. Guess what? God took this situation, this pagan woman who used a pagan idol to help David uh, get an escape, to get a head start on this escape. And so uh, even this lost woman is used of God. What does this say? Well, there's something about this that we don't, we kind of forget sometimes. I think and the idea is that, uh, that God is sovereign over all. So God works out things. He always works things out for us. And however it is, and he's, and evil is not an equal, equal to God. They're not equals. God is not equal to the devil. The devil is not equal to God and therefore is not able to do anything to God. 
And God, on the other hand, can do anything to thee. He can thwart them in any way. He can use them, manipulate their own manipulations, if you will, to use them. And God, uh, God did that. Michael's lies and deception, by the way, she lied to her father because he eventually calls her into, in there. Right? He calls her in. So she finds out that David isn't in the bed. And so he calls his daughter in. She comes in before him. And, he's, and it would have been a crime, a high crime to have, uh, to have gone against the king. So whenever she gets in there, what she do? She says, well, I, I didn't do it against you, dad. I, I just, because David said he was going to kill me. That's why, I, you know, why I didn't, uh, you know, didn't report it to you. Right. And I helped him because he threatened to kill me to make his escape. And uh, so she saved her own skin by this lie, this deception. She deceives her father. She deceives him in this lie. She tells him so that David can get away. Again, none of these are necessarily good things. These are just things that God used to help further David down the road because these people are lost people. She's lost because of her. Uh, we know that because of her idol worship. Saul is outside the will of God because he's trying to kill God's man that God put there. Right? He's already failed his job. And so God uses all of this stuff to further his purpose. We sit around and wring our hands and wonder why this person gets elected or why that person gets elected or why this happens and why that happens. Uh, it, it, it's not because it's all good. It's because it happens because evil is evil. But God uses that. It might be that God, and you know, I say might be, so you know, hear me, I'm not prophesying something here, but God might be using this tremendous amount here in America for our point of view, at least this, this upheaval of our political system over the last several years and, and this, all this turmoil and this pushback against the church to, to refine the church, like refining gold, you know, that like he talks about the, the vine, they prunes the vine to make it grow. He might be finding out just who's who. Not that God doesn't know that, but sometimes we lie to ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm all in, you know, and then some, some squeeze happens and the next thing you know, we're not in. A little, a little something comes along and knocks us off our horse. And are you going to get back on? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to do it? Are you going to curse God? That's what happens to a lot of people when things don't go the way they thought they should. You know, when the health and wealth preachers and, and all the glory and, and all that stuff and all that stuff ha starts happening. And if, and if you're there and it ain't working, well, they're going to tell you it's your fault. And you're going to look at them and say it's God's fault. Uh, that's how it works. You'd think this people would say, well, those guys are off, their, uh, off in outer space. They're wrong. And they are. However, they will, you will more likely blame God. They didn't get to be that powerful because they didn't have some help from the devil. They didn't get those lies sold to everybody because, because people weren't interested in hearing lies. We all are guilty of that. We like to hear good things like that told to us. But we need to focus on Scripture, the truth of Scripture. Jesus told his troops, look, in these last days are going to be tough times. And every, uh, as, as time goes on, time and time and time again, it comes just like Jesus said. We need to be on our guard. But God can guide the intentions of the lost to accomplish the purposes he wanted. Remember when Jesus left the temple? He left the temple in Jerusalem. He said, I'll leave it to you guys. I'm paraphrasing there. Went on off. Disciples, they were around. What did they think about that? Well, we don't hear them say anything immediately. But later on, when when they're looking across the there the valley over to the great temple, they said, oh, Lord, look at that great place. Isn't it wonderful? And Jesus said, there won't be long. There won't be stone upon a stone. I'm sure they were shocked. Somebody's tearing down the church. Somebody's tearing down the temple. And not the fact that it was they're tearing it down, but that it was such a huge edifice, such a huge thing. If you've been uh, following along on Sunday nights with us and we've been seeing how just how big them rocks are. And the fact that they're all scattered all over the place, as Jesus said, when a few short years later, as he, as he prophesied, they happened that people wouldn't know that, that we wouldn't that we wouldn't see how could such a thing happen? Well, the Romans were not God fears and the, Jew, the Jews in Jerusalem at the temple were not, obviously. And so guess what? The, God used the Romans to, to make a point. That right there is a count. That doesn't work. That's not going to work. Their way of doing things is not the right way. God, intent, 
uses the intentions of the lost even to his advantage and to accomplish his purposes. And we go on and see in the story as it goes on a little further down through 18 there and picking it up there. Of course, he, where, does, where does David go? This is now, this is for us, okay? We, we see how it works. We know that these things are going to come. We see how God works. What does David do? Where does he go first off when he's been up threatened? Well, he runs to Samuel. Why not? Samuel's a great spiritual leader of the country, great prophet. Samuel's the guy who, uh, who everyone recognizes as the great prophet of God. So what does he do whenever he's been threatened, when he's been put out <clears throat> under this terrible pressure from the evil? He goes to Samuel, his spiritual leader, a person he can trust, somebody who speaks for God. Now it was about, <clears throat> excuse me, about three miles away that he went. So he didn't go too far. He didn't have to go too far to run into Samuel. By the way, Samuel basically, the Bible said in chapter 15, I think it is, that Samuel didn't go see Saul anymore. So he'd done, he'd done, he didn't see Saul. He didn't go to Saul's house anymore until he died. But David went to Samuel because Samuel, he could trust Samuel and Samuel could give him some guidance and some encouragement. When you're having these problems and when this is pressure is being put on you, you know, go and find some spiritual encouragement, a friend you trust, somebody who's in the word. By the way, that's what qualifies that. First, they got to be in the word. They gotta be a friend of yours, somebody you trust. Go to them and help so they can help encourage you. Look, don't worry. This happens. I remember when it happened to me one time and somebody said, look, you can just count on the evil one coming after you as soon as anything successful happens in your life. So whenever you're under attack and because you're resisting the evil one and you've, or you've achieved some success in your life, you find a spiritual person, a, a spiritual friend. Now, when I say spiritual, I don't mean somebody who goes around with, with uh, crystals hanging from their mirrors or has, uh, you know, uh, I'm spiritual armbands or something stuck on their car. I'm talking about somebody who's in the word. Somebody who's in the word. All right. Spiritual is a word like love. It, you can stick it on anything. I love that air conditioning because when it's hot, it really makes me feel good. Does that mean I have a, a relationship with it in some way? Not really, no. We know these words get stuck on everything. When I say that, I don't mean the same thing that lots of people mean. I know people who believe in rocks and turtles and trees and everything else. They're all spiritual. I mean, I, I've got some relatives that are spiritual, apparently, you know. And uh, the idea here is that we have to uh, we have to recognize that these people are not what we're talking about. We're talking about the idea here. We're talking about people in the word of God. We, we're talking about the people in the word of God. So go to see those. How does it work? Well, he goes there and Samuel and, and him get together and Samuel talks to him. I'm sure encourages him and notice what happens. Saul finds out. And Saul, sends, uh, and Saul sends troops. And what do they do? Does God strike him dead on the road? No, he could have. How does God work? Different ways. Different ways. Here he comes down. These troops come down to get, to get uh, David. And no doubt probably Samuel too. But they come down and he says that they came down and there were some people prophesying. There was Samuel and there's a group of prophets. Now let me explain to you what this means. When these people would do this, what they're talking about here in this particular situation is they would typically get uh, talk. They would get to some way. They'd be talking about God's word. They'd be talking about it. And the spirit of God would come upon them. And as it seemed to be practiced in that time, they would uh, get in a circle and they would continue to quote scripture or something like that. And they would get into sort of a, a state of excitement. And this state of excitement, you know, would be very noticeable and very recognizable. And as these troops came up, they got caught up in it too. How come? Why? Because God distracted them with this activity that was going on. He drew them into this activity such that they forgot what they came to do. They didn't feel like they needed to do it anymore. Uh, he could have done all kinds of things, but he did that. And, that, and, they, and it says there that they... Uh, they got caught up in it, right? Says the verse 20, sent men to capture him, but they saw a group of prophets prophesying 
And Samuel was standing there. No doubt they knew who Samuel was. And the God, Spirit of God, it says in verse 20, came upon the men and they prophesied, meaning they stopped what they were doing and got it caught up in this. And at that point, when it, the word got back to Saul, he sent some more people. And what happened? Well, God did the same thing. You know, you'd think that Saul, of course, we know Saul's not a God, a fearing man or a, God, or a man or a king who recognizes God because he couldn't even figure out what God was doing from the beginning of his whole thing up until even now. He, so he sends more people and they get caught up in it. You get the impression that God's trying to say, Saul, maybe you need to, uh, you know, pay, pay attention here. There's something greater than your troops, greater than your power that's going on. This place is guarded, if you will, so to speak, by the Spirit of God. Now, he didn't put, he didn't do like he did with the, with the other prophet, surround him with the, his host, but they got caught up. They couldn't go on. They didn't even, no doubt, they had no idea. They didn't, lost track of it, got caught up in the prophesying, got talk, caught up in word, God's word. And so then what happens next is, well, Saul says, I'm going to go myself. I'm tired of you guys. You guys are not getting the job done. I'm going to go myself. And again, Saul comes and what happens to him? He gets caught up in it. Now, God takes Saul as he gets caught up in this and shows the world something about Saul and shows Saul something about Saul that will not, that will not wear off. He goes on here and he says that they went over to where uh, Samuel was and where, the, uh, where it was in this Naoth. And when they got there, the Spirit of God came over him. And what happened? He starts to prophesy. The very same thing the troops reported back to him and the very same thing the second group reported. He comes there and he gets caught up in the same thing, showing what? That the power of God is more powerful than the king of Israel, but not just that, but the king of Israel on an evil mission to kill one of God's own people that God had said he was going to, he had a plan for him and that he was going to stop him. And what does he do? He doesn't kill him. He doesn't do anything. What does he do? He, he catches him up in the activity of God. And then what happens? Well, notice in verse 24, it says he stripped off his garments. That was unusual. He took off all of his clothes. Two things about that. One, he took off his king's clothes because he was the king. Whatever he was wearing was king's clothes, different than everybody else. And because of that, he was already, in a way, agreeing without really knowing or thinking about it, I suppose, agreeing with God, saying, you're no longer the king. You, you, don't, even, you don't even look like the king anymore. You're not wearing the king's clothes. But one more step there, he takes off all of his clothes and there for a day and a night lays there naked. What does that mean? Well, that was a shameful thing in Israel. It would be a shameful thing, most even except for a few places in our country. But it's a shameful thing. It's more than this light, take lightly. This was a shameful, terrible thing that you didn't do. It was in what the enemies would do when they captured people was strip them down as a way of shaming them. And people recognized this and that changed everybody's outlook on Saul and it changed Saul's outlook on Saul. And, and so that uh, even they went back to what they said in the very beginning of Saul's days about who is this guy, Saul, is he also a prophet? No, that wasn't a friendly uh, reference to him. It was a, it was a derision, a, der a derogatory reference to him. So what do we get here from this? One, when God does something great in your life and gives you a victory, be ready for an attack. Okay, be ready for an attack. When God attacks... Recognize this, he can use the evil people and other people who are lost to help you, to guide you. He can, he can take what they tended to do and reverse it. He can take what they're going to do and multiply. In the case of uh, David's wife, Michael, he multiplied that such that Michael was able to get David out of town. David saved, he goes. And then remember, you need to get with somebody who's in the word that you trust who will help encourage you. They can't fix it. They can't stop it necessarily because that's not our power but God's power working through somebody can give us strength and encouragement when we're struggling with uh, with the idea of, of how come we got this victory this spiritual success and now we're faced with this uh, evil t attack and notice how God works we know God works all kind of ways here God does a very 
if you if I was going to characterize it, a gentle thing. He gently turns the troops back who came to kill David. Why? Because they didn't die. They got caught up in prophesying. They got they they came down to the worship service and got caught up in it, right? Uh, didn't mean they got saved or anything like that. It just means they came down, they got caught up in the whole thing, and they basically forgot what they were about to do. And then Saul comes down. He gets caught up in it too. And God exposes him literally and figuratively, I guess, as he's no longer the king. He may still have the title. He may still think of himself that way. But however, he has been shamed and people will look at him as no longer the king. Shamed and ruined. And this is what God does. He points out evil for what it is. He exposes it for what it is. And I don't know how many times we see this happen. These people... Uh, even uh, eventually, we want we wish it would happen earlier. Well, I, I always do. I think you probably do too. But eventually, these people become found out. The frauds they are, the uh, things that they do that are so shameful, they're they're found out, exposed, and and people are just shocked sometimes by how that works. But it comes out. The Bible, uh, God will reveal Himself, and He will make sure that right is right and wrong is wrong, and it all gets worked out. You and I need to be willing to recognize God's power. He works in different ways, and we need to trust him. That's what David did. He went. He followed the guidance of God. He listened to his pagan wife, helped him get away. He gets away. He goes to Samuel. Samuel encourages him, and, and God, can, uh, God protects Samuel and David right there. And now we see why uh, Samuel, a long time ago, Verse back in chapter 15, the Bible saw that he never went to Saul's house again until he died. This is not account, uh, does not change this. It was Saul who came to Samuel's house, right? So understand, uh, Samuel recognized Saul for what he was, but now the country begins to see it. These things take time, but these exposures come out and these people are shown for who they are. And you and I need to recognize we don't need to fear them. Uh, we need to trust God. Trust God. Whenever you have a great success, expect some trouble. When trouble comes, trust God. Keep on keeping on, and he will see you through it. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to come into this place. We thank you, Lord, that in our own lives, as we see these victories come along, because we are, uh, Lord, trying to follow you, so we're trying to, to serve you, trying to worship you, Lord, and do these things, learn uh, more about you, that we will achieve great success because you promised it. But we'll also recognize, Lord, that evil is still powerful and still out there trying to throw us off. And we pray, Lord, this morning that we would recognize that for what it is and not let it distract us from the mission that you've given us and or, nor from the success that you've granted us. And not let us be fearful of that, Lord, but recognize that you're more powerful listening to you, seek out guidance, Lord, from you through your word and through those that are in your word to help us in our time of need as David did this morning. We pray, Father, that you would help us in these and other matters and that we'd be great witnesses for you. We ask it all in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Amen.